going on, guys? This is Brian with Simple Man's Comics. I want to welcome everyone to the special premiere of another episode of CBSI Presents Indie Spotlight. And in this episode, we are interviewing Arun Singh from Boom Studios. Without further ado, I want to introduce the guest of honor, Arun Singh. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. Appreciate you guys uh, having me on. I love the site, so I'm really happy to chat with you. I have purposefully not prepped. So whatever questions you guys have for me, honest answers. In addition to the guest of honor, we also have Jack DeMeo, AKA Mr. Bolo. What's going on everybody? Simple Men's Comics family, CBSI Nation. As Brian said, I'm Jack DeMeo, AKA Mr. Bolo, uh, content manager for CBSI. And I'm excited to be here at our second show here on the Simple Men's Comics, where usually Brian and I are a tag team on Thursday nights talking about new comic book day. But today we're bringing in the free bird rule because we're going six man tag action because we got our third partner in crime, Andy Tomberlin from the Indie Spotlight series right here with us on the Indie Spotlight show on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Hey, how's it going everyone? Uh, this is Andy from the Indie Spotlight series over at CBSI and uh, glad to have uh, Arun with us and uh, ready, to, ready to get to it. Because we're all excited to have Arun here. We're all fans of Boom Studios. We welcome the privilege of having him on as a guest tonight. So we want to get started. Arun, for those unfamiliar, what is your background in the industry and then history with comics? Kind of give us a little uh, rundown of where, you, where you've where you come from, where you've been. I, I got to tell you, with that intro, I feel like very Roddy Strong right now, Undisputed Era. But, uh, yeah, you know, uh, no, I'm from, uh, if anybody follows me on Twitter, I talk about it incessantly. Uh, I'm at Arun, A-R-U-N-E. And I'm uh, I'm from Toronto originally, so I grew up a uh, comic book fan as long as I can remember. What I always say is, like, as a kid, I was only I, when I went to grade school, my brother and I were two of like the only non-white kids in school, and it was a really weird thing growing up outside, outside Toronto in the '80s. You know, like um, not seeing myself, you know, in the people around me, and not always fitting in. But the place I always felt like I could fit in was in comics because I remember picking up like uh, one of my earliest comics and I'm forgetting the issue number is that Legion of Superheroes comic where Tyrock is shaking his hand and the Legion's flying away. And that was a hand-me-down for one of my cousins. And it was like, I know that the um, certain aspects of the comic had not aged as well as others, but um, it is like, that was where I'm like, hey, there's someone who looks closer to me in a comic or I could pick up an issue of like classic X-Men and it'd be like, hey, you know, there's characters with different accents and there's a Canadian character like Wolverine and all that stuff like gave me a sense of community. And I found as a kid, when I walked into a comic shop, no one cared that my name was kind of unusual to them or that, you know, I liked eating different food or that I looked different. All they cared about was like, who's your favorite X-Men character? And as long as I replied Wolverine, we were good. <laughs> the actual answer was Cyclops because Cyclops is the best, but it's, uh, yes. you know, like that's all that, that's all that mattered. And that was like, to me, that's been always the power of comics. Um, and honestly, like, you know, as a teenager, I remember, um, I was like 16 or something. And I told my parents, I'm like, don't worry by the time I'm 19, I'll stop reading comics or kid stuff. I was still just buying like wizard and a issue of Robin or X-Men at the time. Um, and then when 19, age 19 hit, man, like, planetary powers authority like superman for all seasons like this whole like flood of amazing books hit me that like really showed me like how much more superheroes because that was my primary comic interest how much more like superheroes could be and i was like oh cool uh i guess i lied to my mom because i'm definitely never leaving comics um and uh you know i my life's like i, I there's a whole bunch of different directions my life could have taken but honestly um I started when I moved to America, I came here as a student. I was, came with my family and I was a student at the University of Minnesota. I dropped out my first day of college before convocation. And I was like, look, this is, I don't wanna be in business school. I don't wanna be in business. And so uh, my parents somehow were understanding and we're like, hey, cool. Well, like you're also don't have a work visa right now. So you can't earn money. So what are you gonna do? And me being the industrious kid I was, I'm like, well, if I like do all your landscaping for you, you can just give me cash as like an inflated allowance. That's legal, I think. Don't anyone, don't call ICE. Um, I'm a citizen now. So I then, the comic shop near me, Mind's Eye Comics in um, Egan, Minnesota, it's now moved to Burnsville re last year actually. 
but in uh, Egan, um, I got to know the Andrew, the owner there, Andrew Troth, and the um, managers there, uh, Mike Lier and uh, Arthur uh, Lender. And they were like, and they asked me to come work there. And I basically worked there on Wednesdays for store credit, which as far as I know was totally legal and the store discount. And then I started, I got a job working for IGN at the time, writing a DC comics column weekly. So the job at the comic shop allowed me to get the comics to write the column. And I was paid for none of this, but somehow I had more comics than I ever had in my life. I got to write about comics. And I was like, hey, this could maybe be a career for me. Life takes you in weird directions. Um, I worked for CBR for six years as a staff writer when I was doing other jobs and uh, happened to be in New York um, December 06. I had gone back to college to, to study criminal justice. And after one semester, I got kicked out of my criminal justice class for arguing with my teacher, who was also a Salt Lake City judge, enough about law and our systems and recidivism that I decided to become an, <laughs> that I decided I should become an EMT instead. And so I got my EMT certification, thought I was going to be pre-med. Um, and again, I, want, I don't want to get into my like crazy health history, but somehow visiting Toronto and coming back to Utah, my doctor's telling me I got bit by a mosquito and ate a bad piece of meat, went into a coma for a day, had the symptoms of both West Nile and meningitis. So I had to take the semester yeah. off college. And I was like, what do I do? My brother lives in New York. Why didn't I visit? Oh man, I got to visit Marvel in DC. I grew up a DC guy, honestly. Like, the Legion is the best to me. The last week before I was, the last two days before I was going to leave New York, I go, happened to visit Marvel. The DC offices were closed. I met David Gabriel, who's the head of sales there. And he, I would, he was like, oh, hey, are, are you like, essentially like, are you interested in a job? And I'm like, wait, what? I, a job at, at Marvel? What did it? And he's like, and it turns out like he knew me from my CBR work, but he had read an interview with me in Soap Opera Digest. So let me explain. Do you guys remember the Do you guys remember the OC in like the third yeah. season? They had a story where they made a comic a Wildstorm. So Soap Opera Digest needed to interview a comic expert. They had interviewed me, and it was like a page long interview in Soap Opera Digest. I remember going to like the grocery store and buying like ten copies of this, and the cashier being really confused. Now, the, 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 now the, tr the truth is, I'm like a huge daytime soap guy. Like I watch General Hospital every day, and like don't mess with my stories. But like, um, I hate to say it, I know, I know about General Hospital too. My mom was a big influence on that. Yeah, and so like, you know, it's uh, out brick. so yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I have. So he's like, hey, uh, why don't you come to our interview? So me deciding to tempt fate even further. The morning I have my interview with Marvel, I get this Iron Fist tattoo done uh, inside my arm, and then wow. go for the interview not really thinking through that if this interview goes bad, I'm going to hate this tattoo forever. Uh, it was around the time Immortal Iron Fist was just coming out. I think issue two had just hit and I love that book. I interviewed, I then joined Marvel in early 2007. Uh, part of the reason I was off work is I had a pretty major surgery. They like uh, cut my chest, uh, cut my chest open, saw my sternum in two and like took out these tumors. And now that's another podcast. Um, wow. But I finally got to came to New York and I was like, you know what, let me, let, you know what, worst case, I do this for six months and then I go back to Salt Lake or do it for a year. I've worked for Marvel. I can go become a doctor, finish pre-med. And now 12 years later, I'm still in comics. And so um, all that not giving up comics is what got me to Marvel. I met my wife at Marvel. She worked in the finance department there. And I uh, love at first sight. She is far too good for me. Any, I mean, you guys have all followed me on Instagram. My wife is way too good looking, way yes. too smart, way too cool for me. Like you come to our townhouse and you're like, oh, look at all this comic stuff. Arun, you're a geek. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's my wife. She bought me a Snake Eyes Katana for one of my birthdays and insists on displaying it in the front hall. And it's the first thing you see when I enter our house. And like, mm. we have art all across the walls. That's all her choice. Cases full of like statues. Uh, I score, I hit the jackpot guys. And so yeah. she, um, you know, I was at Marvel and I headed up PR there eventually. Um, and, and both the comic side and then till 2013 and then from 2013 to 2015 on the television side, launching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, Marvel's Daredevil, Marvel's Agent Carter, a whole bunch of animation stuff too, working with great folks. You know, then left in 2015 to join Sci-Fi. And uh, in 2016, Sci-Fi reorged a bit. Say la vie. I was looking for work. Happened to have lunch with Philip Sablik, who's the president uh, and head of 
marketing and or the president of publishing and marketing here at Boom Studios. He was looking for someone to join the team. I happened to be available. I love comics. I love what Boom was doing. They had just launched Power Rangers that year. I was like, yeah, I want to be part of this. And I joined as uh, I joined as a consultant in uh, October 2016 and then as VP marketing in December 2016. And I have uh, been here uh, ever since. It's uh, my hopefully short-ish version of uh, how I got to comics. But like the thing I would tell you as a guy who has World of Warcraft tattoos and G.I. Joe tattoos and tattoos from Angel and tattoos from like a Superman Kingdom Come tattoo here. Like if you love comics, like just like what you guys are doing, like if you love comics, you can find a way to make a career out of it. And it's, it's the best. I'm telling you, I love working in TV, love everyone I met there, but comics is the best, period. I think the, the one word that comes to mind after that is just inspirational. I mean, yeah. Oh, thanks, man. Dude, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's saying something, doing all that and, uh, and, and getting to where you're at and, and the, the trials and tribulations. I mean, it sounds like you've, you've been through your fair share too, to get where you're at. And, uh, man, I, uh, that's, that's what, that's what the dream is, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, Arun, you mentioned now again, comics being a labor of love. Yeah. It's your job, but it's something that you're passionate about and you enjoy yeah. What I would love to know, and I think a lot of Simpleman's Comics uh, viewers would love to know, is is kind of your personal collecting history. How long have you been collecting? What, uh, what type of things do you collect? And uh, what are you currently buying and looking for? Yeah, um, I think the earliest comics I can remember having were mostly like hand-me-downs from my cousin. Uh, I got a lot of like, like I was mentioning, like I had that issue of Legion with, you know, shaking his fist at Tyrock and like the cover was taped up because you're trying to just keep it together. Um, I re I remember I had a, oh God, is it, was it Marvel Tales? Whatever the one, they were reprinting the original Uncanny X-Men ones and it reprinted Uncanny X-Men 4. And I remember it was the issue with like Namor where Magneto's like manipulating Namor. And, uh, I remember he has this like whole line about how like no one uh, on his, like uh, on his home turf, he can never be defeated. And I always remember that because like my brother and I used to get bullied a lot when we were kids. And we used to always think of that comic because we used to like envision ourselves a little bit more like Namor being like, you know, um, if no anyone, but as long as we can make it home onto our driveway and we're home, like no one can beat us there. And I remember like the X-Men were one of the first comics we really connected with because it was uh, really about like um, the plight of people who felt outside the norm. And uh, Legion of Superheroes, you know, like a lot of the basic stuff, like we love Batman, Richie Rich, Archie, um really loved the superpowers comics as a kid and those, those mini series because um you know when i was a kid they were selling the superpowers toys you know where you squeeze the legs and they punch they used to sell those at like the shell gas station near us so like oh, i didn't yeah. know that's how i got into like i didn't know what firestorm was till i got that figure right and then i love firestorm because you're a kid right you get the toy and you you're so happy to have it you like shape your interests and your and you find a way to imprint yourself on that character so it was like it was like Firestorm and Hawkman and like um, you know we had the Batman and Superman, but also like I never could get any of the villain toys um, for some reason. And it was like except for that Riddler one, remember that punches himself in the face? And you're like, why is it? Yeah, like who? Like couldn't you just move that over a little? Or oh, the one that the one that was like I liked it because it was Lex Luthor, but the Lex Luthor one of him in the suit was also kind of like stiff and lame, and. Um, but those Before, toys were like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had the, he had the, he had the little kryptonite ring that would like, that after a while would just like scuff off. And it was like, um, but superpowers, like, so like I really was into DC. So like as a kid, um, my parents were really big on, um, they didn't watch want me to see violence against other people. So like, I couldn't watch GI Joe as a kid. Irony being that my brother and I were obsessed with GI Joe. Like he was obsessed with Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow on the Rasha Kage clan. And I was really into Duke and like those and Flint and those characters. Um, and so like we weren't allowed to watch J.J. Joe where you were shooting at each other. Like people are shooting at each other even with lasers. But like we'd sneak watch it at our friend's house because in the 80s, how could you not watch G.I. Joe? But we were allowed to watch like Transformers because it was robots fighting or we could watch He-Man because you we were fighting demons. So I actually couldn't read a lot of Marvel comics. Like I could read Transformers. I remember um, there's an issue of Transformers and they had that ad for, I think it's the Ann Nascenti, um, 
typhoid Mary run of, uh, of uh, Daredevil where the ad is like, she loves him, so she had to kill him. And she's standing above Daredevil's body in the pool of blood. And I remember being in the back of her Toyota Previa, right? Like looking at my mom being like, mom, if she loves him, why does she have to kill him? And she's like, cause that comic's trash. And I'm like, <laughs> actually like, you shouldn't be reading that stuff or looking at those ads. And she was gonna tear out the page. And I'm like, no, 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 but there's a story page on the other side. I need to see what Fortress Maximus does. Um, and so like, uh, those are a lot of the early comics I had. So naturally it was a lot of DC stuff, right? Cause DC was generally cleaner. I wasn't reading like the Denny O'Neill question or Dark Knight Returns. Um, I distinctly also remember a poster for the killing joke in my local comic shop that my mom never liked and she hated it because it looked so violent. Um, she was right. Uh, but uh, I, you know, it was all that basic stuff as a kid. Um, and so as a kid, that's the stuff I read. As a teenager, I fell out a little bit and like got into like Magic the Gathering and Spellfire and like um, the Star Trek card game, a lot of card games. Uh, and I was always reading Wizard, though, still, because, like, in Canada, when I looked at the cost of comics, like, a copy of Wizard was a cost of, like, two comics. So, like, it, and some level, I could keep up with more stuff with Wizard. So, uh, I was still trying to get a copy of Robin, because Chuck Dixon Robin was my jam. And then, like, X-Men, and um, I had to have X, I always liked the Fabian Niciesa X-Men the most. Um, but that was, like, I had to get those issues. And then after a while, like, that and Uncanny got so tied together, I couldn't afford it. Um, but I never really got into hardcore, like collecting variant covers. Cause honestly, like we were a lower middle-class family. We couldn't afford the variant. So like I'd buy the standard editions. Um, and so my, I got a, I got a comic here for the CGC conversation. So, um, I'm a giant Hawkman fan. So like, I love Hawkman, Golden Age Hawkman, Carter Hall, uh, Shira Hall. Like that's my, that is, I think like most overlooked superhero that I think is perfect for exploitation and media. And so I will never shut up about Hawkman. And uh, so I was, I remember like the 90s gold foil Hawkman cover and how much I wanted it after zero hour. Uh, and like, I was like, oh, I gotta have this and I couldn't afford it and it was too expensive. And so I was tweeting one day about like, oh man, I need a not CGC 9.8 of this cover because like kind of jokingly, but Ross Ritchie, who's our CEO and founder just sent me a photo. He goes, oh, you mean like this? And like, just, just making fun of me on Twitter. So the next day I get into the elevator with him. He goes, Hey, uh, I got something for you. And he actually gave me his graded 9.8 copy. And this was like last wow. year. And like, I know this is worth probably like this issue. It like whatever the CGC he paid to get this done. The pricing is like, makes no sense. Cause this comics worth the CGC pricing plus a dollar 50. But it's, um, but honestly, like, this is like, uh, I never understood like slabbing a comic until this, and now I get it. And so now I've gone like hardcore into buying like all these issues from my childhood I wanted, like all these X-Men comics in 9.8. Um, I was at WonderCon and I was like uh, going through like back issue bins to find the right copy of G.I. Joe 21 at what I think is actually gonna grade out at like a 9.6, um, maybe a 9.8, and I got it for a steal. Like it was under a hundred bucks, which to me is a great deal. I was looking up, I was trying to get every copy of Spider-Man number one, the McFarlane one I could find. As long as it was a comic, I was buying it. I was just taking like, if I saw five on a rack, I'd buy all five. I was like doing my, you know, I was looking through my phone and seeing like what were comics sold for on eBay last while I was like um, looking at uh, like Carnage Mind Bomb, you know, or I was looking at like Venom Lethal Protector. And like y'all have been a really good resource with all the bolos, man, because I'll be like, oh cool, this is the version of Lethal Protector that I want to get because this is the misprint, or this one's heating up, or like this issue of like Spider-Man's hot. And so um, the next one I really want to grab is uh, the first Scarlet Spider costume appearance. Cause like I love Scarlet Spider. Wait, wait, I think I got it here. I even sit with a Scarlet Spider toy in my office. And so like in the other comic I bought the other day, like just at Earth 2 Comics and Sherman Oaks, I bought a copy of uh, Fantastic 451. Not because um, I think there's any reason it's gonna pop anytime soon, but because it's like that iconic cover. And like, so, you know, reading CBSI, following Simple Man Comics, Indie Spotlight, and I guess Indie Spotlight doesn't ap appeal um, apply here. But like following all this stuff online, following some of the other like top sites in your in your um, area of expertise, I learned a lot more about what collectors and speculators are going after. And it's like these iconic covers, 
the big story moments. And I'm like, you know what? Let me invest in that. Worst case, I own one of the best covers in comic history. Uh, uh, best case, it pops. And so I'm, uh, you know, I have a copy of Ultimate Comics Spider-Man number one, the first uh, Miles Morales issue, not his first appearance, but that first issue signed by Stan Lee that I'm getting graded right now. Um, oh. Back from my time at Marvel that I'm holding on to forever, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure it'll grade out at a nine six or a nine eight. And so, like, so really uh, on the regular. Um, Right now, obviously, other than Boom Books, which I'd be buying if I wasn't here, uh, I buy, you know, Excellence, that new series from Image. I'm like, uh, I'm super into it. New Hawkman series by Robert Venditti and Brian Hitch. I'm like, you'll you'll be proud of me. I just tell my, I just tell Earth 2 here in Sherman Oaks, I'm like, just give me both covers or give me all the covers. Like, there's so many books now where I'm like, just, just give me all the covers that are below 50 bucks because like, I just want them all. <laughs> And I'll regret it because I like I see the stuff that pops and I don't like I don't go sell them, but it does feel good to be like, oh, yeah. I got this for three bucks and it's worth twenty now. Yeah. Like that's cool. You're uh, um, you're you're truly you're truly one of us. Is is the bottom yeah. line of what I get out of here? Yeah, well that's what, <laughs> yeah. that, that's what that's what Ross has done to me. That's what Ross has done. He's got me in this mindset of like, so Michelle, my wife, she like she's like, look, I've had like ten eye surgeries in the last ten years. My wife though, Michelle's got great eyes. So she'll look at comics for me and she can see discoloration even through like the bag. She can see discoloration or the slightest curve or indent. Yeah. And like she negotiated down a, a X-Men 25 for me that I thought was in mint, or in mint, whatever, you know, multiple. Nine, I yeah. thought it was like an easy nine eight. And like, yeah. she's like, no, no, no. Look at that scratch on the hologram. You're not paying full price for that. And I'm like, you're the best. I just. <laughs> Just the best. You got your own and, CGC grader on hand, yeah, right? Yeah. And Ross was super impressed. He's like, you got to take Michelle to more shows with you. I'm like, she, oh, like, of course, she's my wife. She's coming to everything to grade with me. So we're going to a Comic-Con Revolution next week in Ontario, California. And I'm like, Michelle, you got to help me grade some comics. I know what I'm looking for. I know like the uh, like Scarlet Spider-esque kind of like things I want to go get. Like I, um, I got a 9-8 Adventures of Superman 500 recently because, uh, I'm like, at some point, maybe there'll be a Steel movie, but I also love Superboy. It's the first appearance of Connor Kent Superboy. Let me get into that. You know, I love that. Um, I'm also like, you know, Donny Cates, who you guys love. He does really well for you. Um, 100%. Yeah, he's he's one of my best friends. The guy's like family. Um, I moderated his panel at WonderCon and we had a great time. And like, I buy everything Donny does, not just because I love the guy, but because I think he's just one of the most talented writers of the last decade, if not longer. That dude is so rock and roll and I love it. Um, yeah. Scott Snyder is another guy. I just, you know, it's funny. I follow authors, I think, and artists a lot more now. Scott Snyder does anything. I'm there for it. Um, on the artist side, if anybody from the Raid studio in Toronto, so like Francis Manipal, uh, Marcus Toe, Ramon Perez, Kalman Androsovsky, any of those guys do anything. They're my hometown boys, but also like they're just so talented and I, they tend to pick projects I really love. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I don't buy as many superhero comics monthly, if I'm being completely honest. Um, Teen Titans by Adam Glass, who's also a buddy. I dig that book. It's a lot of fun. Crush is fun. Damian Wayne running a superhero team is fun. Uh, but yeah, my pull list is um, anything that's a number one, anything that is a number one from any company, almost any company, um, I will probably try out. So either I'll buy a physical copy or I'll, what I'll do is, um, cause I have kind of crap eyes. I read a lot of comiXology and I buy a lot of digital comics. So like, honestly, every Tuesday night I stay up till midnight and I'm like, yes, comiXology has a comics up and I get my number ones. And if there's like a number one, I forgot to pre-order. I, uh, I'll, I'll, t I'll DM Car D'Angelo or uh, his wife, Susan at a, uh, who run earth two comics. And I'll be like, I need this issue today. And they already know it means I probably just read it on my <laughs> iPad. But what I try to do is I try to like, um, I try to also buy physical copies of whatever I can. Um, I really uh, love Jerry Duggan's new book analog. Uh, that was like a, uh, that was a real fun, a high concept book. And I hope it, hope it comes back soon. I, I just reread the first collection the other day. Um, Skyward by, but my, two of my friends, Joe Henderson and Lee Garbett is a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I'm being really image heavy and I don't mean to be, you know, um, anything Greg Pak does, anything Marjorie Lou does, um, anything Rick Remender does. I always try out. I think Rick and I, uh, definitely have different perspectives on stuff, but like, he's a great guy. And like, 
he goes to some crazy dark places I can't even imagine. Like, but like, it's always so good. Like low is low is probably my favorite thing he's done. I love low. I loved fear agent. Um, you know, deadly class is a trip. Seven to attorney. Yeah. 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 And like the seven to attorney is one of those books. I actually like, I need to, I actually like reading each single issue. Cause it's so like him and Jerome do such incredible work. Like I want to pour over the panels and appreciate like the art form going on there. And I honestly think like Jerome Pena is like one of the best artists in comics. And I still don't yeah. think he's got the do. Those are, and those are also like Ed, anything Ed Brubaker does, right? Like anything Matt Fraction, Kelly Sue DeConnick. And it's not just cause I'm picking image books, but these are people I got to know as Marvel and, and many of them I count as friends. So like, these are the people like, like I think you're probably the same, right? Jason Aaron does a book. I don't care what it's about. It's, it could be, Jason Aaron could write a comic about a phone book, about him reading the phone book. And I would still buy it cause it's like Jason Aaron doing it. And you know, it's going to yep. be like, holy yep. scripture down from the heavens, man. So to kind of uh, piggyback on what you were saying too, like um, the people that you've gotten to know, and then again, you know, this being a labor of love, and you did also mention, yeah, we do, we, we follow you on Instagram. So we did, one thing we kind of got to see um, that I think we were all kind of jealous of, Brian and I were talking about after the Bolo show last Thursday, was we saw you were on the set of Lucifer this year, which recently yeah. uh, back, uh, came back on, I guess, on your small screen uh, through streaming services with Netflix. Um, what, what was that like? How did that come to be? Um, and are you a big fan of the series like we are? Yeah, so like I met Joe seven years ago. Seven years ago, I think I want to met, say I met him. Uh, I forget how we got connected. We, oh, okay, this was, this is how funny it's small. Okay, a buddy of mine, uh, Tim Dillon, he's, uh, he's an executive director of marketing over at Marvel Television. He was at Marvel Studios. Before that was on the west on the east coast with me. He used to head up like all the advertising and convention stuff for Marvel um, before he went over to studios. And so um, we were having a going away party when he was officially moving to LA. We happened to be at a bar where this other group of people happened to be in town. One of them, including uh, Jeff King, who's a good friend who wrote Convergence for DC. And he was when Jeff was an executive producer in White Collar, which was filming in New York. And so then I met this other guy working on the show, Joe Henderson, who happened to be writing. And we all kind of got along and all like hockey. And uh, Jeff is also a fellow uh, ex Canuck like myself. And uh, so we were talking and then we met like, um, made another friend, Sprague Graydon. She was also on White Collar. She played um, the president's daughter in like the last season, season eight of 24. And all a bunch of us just randomly met at this, at this bar. And we're like, let's all just be friends as one does. And Joe and I kept up through the years um, as I did with Jeff and Sprague. And like, uh, so Joe and I have kept in touch. And like, I used to give him a hard time about Lucifer because I, um, when I was at CBR, I used to do a lot of coverage of Lucifer. And uh, Mike Carey and Peter Gross wrote me into Lucifer, the comic. So I think it's Lucifer 60 or 61. Um, when spoiler, I forget the girl's name. Is it Al Elaine is wrong. When she remakes the universe, She's like trying to create, she's doing like a pocket universe and she's like creating different versions of God. And there's a version of God who comes down as a wolf and his name's Arun, A-R-O-O-N. So that is me being, and so I used to give Joe, I used to give Joe a hard time. I'm like, hey dude, when you're casting Arun in your show, make sure you call me. And, um, my, and Michelle loves Lucifer. We both enjoyed watching on Fox and it was filming. Uh, she, my wife works at Warner Brothers. So um, we just happened, to, he let us know when we could come visit. We uh, came by to visit, he introduced us to Tom Ellis, who is a gentleman, he's a great dude. And it turns out like all, all British actors and these superhero shows kind of know each other. So he knows Charlie Cox who played Daredevil and he knows Nick Blood who played, uh, who, who, who was on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as well and whose character name I'm forgetting because Nick Blood is such a great real name. Um, Hunter, he played Hunter. And um, yeah, yeah, and so like, you know, we all kind of got along real well. I also know Amy Garcia from the show cause she happens to be really good friends with another friend of mine, AJ Mendez, formerly AJ Lee of uh, WWE. And so I already knew oh. some people on the show. And so like, I got to, we have to see Tom film some scenes, got a photo with him. It was a ton of fun. Like I look, I've been super lucky in life to, uh, to just get to meet these folks. Um, I think what you find though, and you guys have found this too, I'm sure, is like what's really important, I think, like Joe and I just, Joe and I met each other and we were just cool to each other because we were cool. 
uh, to each other. And like now it's blossomed into like a friendship and like me coming to Lucifer and like, you know, we can hook each other up with free comics and like, I find in life and in comics in general, man, if you're just really cool to each other, uh, everything else kind of works out. There's also been another photo, if you're trolling my Instagram, um, we had Jay August Richards come by the office before Angel launched. Yeah. And uh, I knew him from when he was, on that, when he was on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And it honestly, and I don't think Jay will mind me saying this. Yeah, he was Deathlock. So Jay and I would like keep up on, on, like, on Twitter and stuff, but he just called me the other day. He's like, hey dude, I could use your advice on a thing. And we started talking and I'm like, hey dude, um, so you know, next week we're gonna be a surprise announcement this Angel comic, you gotta come by the office. And so, you know, I think everyone knows we did the surprise launch of Angel and it was, um, you know, it was, uh, he came by and that was like, that was a relationship that was maintained from us just being cool with each other and like running into each other at things. And so um, all those good relationships I've built with people have just been like, if you, I find if you like enter relationships with people and you're just cool about it, um, whether it be your retailer who's getting hooking you up with comics or just people you meet in life, I feel like you the good things will come to you if you put that energy out there. Do I, if I, hopefully I don't sound too Tony Robbins about it. I think that's absolutely a major uh, piece of advice for everybody out there that's watching or whether you're listening to us in the audio version. Um, he he mentioned that you know for us as well. I, I, real quick story: the very first uh, convention I ever covered for CBSI. Um, one of my very first interviews was with Jason Latour. And when I finished, I asked him, I said, if you asked him if he had any advice um, for somebody who wanted to get into the industry, um, wasn't really sure where in the industry I wanted to kind of find my place, but I was, I'm interested in getting into the industry and, and, what, and what advice. And the no, first thing and only thing he said to me was, don't be a jerk. He said, you'll be amazed how far you can go in this industry just by having people like you. And um, I have taken that to heart and try to make sure that that is something I kind of carry with me. So I think that for, I know we have a lot of listeners out there who are aspiring artists or aspiring writers. And I think that's something to listen to coming from a vice president of a major company like Boom Studios that, you know, that your attitude goes a long way in this industry. Yeah, I gotta tell you guys, like, it's just in life, like um, I find, and especially in comics, comics is a small industry. like. Part of the reason Philip had that lunch with me one day to talk to me, he was asking, he, Philip and I knew each other from when he was a top cow. Like the first time I met Philip was Ron Mars was giving me Witchblade trade paperback or collections. Um, and like, and, and, and like Philip looks, he goes, um, why are you walking away with all these comics? And I'm like, Ron gave them to me. <laughs> and like, that's how we met each other. Uh, Ron's a great dude. Uh, we kind of like kept up on Facebook, you know, as people keep up on Facebook. Um, but he just hit me up out of the blue to like, he 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 got lunch with me he, so he could ask me for recommendations for the job that he ultimately hired me for because he had no idea that I was even available. But like that all came out of like, just us always being decent to each other and me not having a terrible reputation as far as I know. So like, but people remember, man, and people remember in comics because you, know, you guys know you've talked to so many creators like, Every pro like you don't get into comics to get rich. You get into comics because yeah. you love it. Whether it's whether you're on the collecting side, the speculator side, the retail side, the create the creator side, the the business side, you get into this because you love it. And like um, all all I think all any of us wants is like just someone not to be a jerk. <laughs> like because we all we're all we're all happy to succeed and fail on our own merits, but we just don't want people you know like being jerks when they don't need to because it's hard enough to succeed in comics without someone else putting themselves in your way or stepping on you. And, um, you know, every success that I've had is just from come from like being the best person I can be. And I think the one piece of advice I'd give is when people say you should be liked, and I'm sure this is what Jason meant when he said it to you is like, it doesn't mean be false. Um, it just means like, be honest, um, be yourself and be the best version of yourself. And honestly, you'll screw up sometimes, but it'll even out, man. And like, just find your passions, be yourself. And remember, uh, social media is public. No matter how private you think it is, people can see it. I know it sounds dumb, but the internet's a public place. Uh, so what you say there will impact your future. You can, you can like it or dislike it, but it's just how it is. So Arun, being that this is obviously the Indie Spotlight series, um, we're here to talk about independent comics, and Boom is one of the leaders in creator-owned independent comics. 
Um, and one thing kind of we were kind of curious about is what type of creator is Boom looking to work with? What type of series is, is Boom looking to put out when you guys are kind of looking at collaborating with various creators and, uh, and uh, writers and artists in the industry? I think, you know, I'm not on the editorial side, so I can't speak to their specific like uh, passions. But what I can tell you, generally speaking, and it's something that Ross Ritchie, our, our CEO and founder, I think has ingrained in this company is he, everybody at this company is looking for projects born out of genuine passion. Because the best, the best comics are the ones people are passionate about, not the ones they're doing because uh, they are trying to get a paycheck, right? So you'll find even if it's on the license side, the people who come on board to write Power Rangers, for example, all are diehard Power Rangers fans or have a real passion for it, right? Or it affected them at some point. You're not just hiring someone randomly to write Power Rangers and, uh, or just because they're a name. And it's the same thing with our original series. We're always looking for projects born out of passion, born out of something like personal and born out of like that uh, story that you need to tell, like that kind of story that is you will explode if you don't get to tell that story and and look frankly a lot of what this company has been based on in our history here and so much of it previous to me next year will be 15 years of boom and i've only been here for about three of them um you know has been boom has been founded on boom has always been the company that did the things people said you can't do so right people said you can't do kids comics no one wants them boom does adventure time and it gets huge you know uh People say there's, uh, you know, teens, uh, middle grade readers don't come in for comics. Boom does Lumberjanes uh, that sells one, has sold over 1.5 million copies worldwide. Uh, you know, no one does middle grade horror. We team up with R.L. Stein. And what I can tell you is that we are already north of 210,000 copies of Just Beyond the Scare School. R.L. Stein's first original graphic novel in comics, um, I guess that's redundant, but his first original graphic novel uh, has already sold over 210,000 copies and it doesn't come out till September. And wow. that's like, that's gigantic. And that is credit to our VP editorial, Bryce Carlson, who brought um, R.L. Stein in here to work on that. But there, there's no real middle grade horror category in comics right now. I'm sure there's a lot of wonder, wonderful people doing those books, but you're, you're t when you're talking about those kind of units being moved and credit to the marketing and sales teams here at Boom and the editorial team for making a great book, Com Boom's a company that, that does stuff that other people um, just, I think for the most part, don't do. Now, we also do a lot of stuff that is like, uh, you may say falls into the typical conventions. We do horror comics, we do sports comics, but I do think there's a, I think there's something in the secret sauce of how Boom makes them because comics are created by our editorial team and it's not marketing and sales telling them what comics to make or, or, or nudging them in what direction or how to make them. I think because they're created purely through that synth synthesis of creators, writers, artists, colorists, letterers, inkers, and the editorial team, you get comics that have a bit more, that have, I think, a ton of integrity to them, which isn't to say other publishers don't have that. But I do think that whenever you read a boom book, um, I think you look at any boom release in 2019, because I can my my short term memory shot. And I'll stick with 2019. Um, there's no there's no comic you're going to read and say like, why did they make that? Every one of them you're going to read and be like, oh, I can see what story they were trying to tell, and it could be a fun action adventure like Ronan Island. But you know what Greg Pak is trying to do with Asian American representation and the story he's telling about disparate people coming together, um, or it could be a book like Faithless, which I know you guys have chatted about a lot too. That is um, a story that Brian Azarella, Maria Lovett, and our uh, executive editor, Sierra Han, really wanted to tell about um, identity and, and, women, and a woman's journey for, uh, through identity and finding herself in, in the modern world. And I think um, obviously with adult themes and content. And I think that is, um, those are the kind of projects you find at Boom, only at Boom. And I think we're always trying to find, be the place where creators can tell the stories they that they want to tell in the best possible way so that is not only editorial but that's like our design team our production values like we want everything to be like the coolest like who would have imagined grant morrison ever doing a santa claus comic right that's yeah. an action comic that's what he does at boom and i think you'll see like matt kent's projects that he does here are so different than the kent projects he's done elsewhere um 
you know, if and and for those Matt Kent fans, uh, hopefully you read Black Badge because you can see yeah. Uh, yeah. nods to mind management in that book too. So definitely check that out. But you know, like Kieran Gillen is joining us um, in August with a new series called Once in Future, and it's gonna. Um, it is, you know, uh, it is a really awesome multi generational story in the vein of Indiana Jones. Um, and uh, it's a kind of fun story you've never seen him do anywhere else. I've been reading Kieran Gillen scripts for 10 years. I was, uh, I used to joke with him that Dar Dark Avengers Ares was like, was, uh, or it was my favorite um, limited series for a number of years because it was so cool and I love his Ares. And I just want him to write like Ares and Namor. Um, and like Emma Frost is a team up book forever. And he's, um, but we have like these creators who join us here and they get to tell stories that they haven't got to tell anywhere else. or they choose to tell stories they haven't told anywhere else because they come to work with the editors here, with everyone here. And we want them to tell those, pa we want them to bring passion projects here. And we found all those projects born of passion are the ones that have always sold the best for us. And the ones that people told us we couldn't do um, those have always been gigantic hits for us. Those are the ones you almost wanted. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. I mean, that that's the only way to do it, man. Like, look at us. We're all not all sitting here because because uh, we have a uh, you know all this time because we have all this free time. We're doing it because we love comics, and that's the kind of people we bring here. You got to love yeah. comics. You said a lot right there, and I got, I took a lot of good things from there. I took the the fact that it's all about diversity. You can you can do children's books, and then you can do something like Faithless. Uh, I mean, you can you can look for the medium. I can remember growing up as a kid reading R.L. Stein in the in the library at my school, yeah. you know. And and now you're you're bringing him to the comic side, and and you're 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 doing a lot of good stuff and a lot of different stuff, and it seems to all be working. The main thing I want to talk about is, is is the Faithless title. That that was a big big step out kind of from boom. I haven't really yeah. seen that direction yet with the, the erotica variants and the, the poly yeah. bags and stuff like that. And, and being at those other Marvel and DC, like you have been, I, I don't think that was something that could have been done there. I mean, it, 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 give us a little bit about the thought process behind releasing that variant and, uh, and, and maybe some of the upcoming ones. I know you've got a upcoming one this week to tomorrow. Yeah. In fact, out uh with uh vanessa del rey i mean and that's a, she's a she's a huge huge artist um a huge following and and her getting her on board to do this i mean talk about that a little bit yeah i would say um you know faithless is a project uh that sierra hunter executive editor she used to be at dark horse she was at dc previous to that she uh she brought to um boom studios working with help craft with brian and you know um this is kind of the kind of book that Ross has always wanted to do here, Ross Ritchie, he's always wanted to do, which is he wants creators to be able to bring the story here that they want to tell that you might not be able to tell anywhere else. Like, I think this book, you know, um, I don't know any other uh, major American comics publisher who would publish this book. Um, certainly, I could see a world where maybe Image might do it too. And, you know, Vertigo's done a lot of cool stuff over the years, but, um, you know, I have the covers here. So like even, even the main cover for Faithless is a bit more uh, is a bit more racy than maybe covers you've seen before. Um, you know, we had the Lee Bermejo variant, which was also hot, and then yeah, the erotic cover that honestly, like, I'd get in trouble if I opened the poly bag up and showed you guys right now. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. what I'd say is uh, this all came. It, it actually the great part about this is, guys, none of this came from marketing and sales. We weren't like, hey, you know what would sell comics? Let's do a Brian Azzarello book with a Lee Bermejo variant because uh, they're a great team. This was all something editorial naturally put together. Sierra put together with Brian, with Maria, and they. Um, and it's a kind of book we. Want. It's a story that's personal to everybody involved in the series, and that's why we wanted to tell it. And when we looked at saying, do we want to do some more adult content? I would argue that the question everybody in the company asks is, are we doing adult content for the sake of adult content? Or is it part of, is it intertwined artistically with the story we need to tell? And ultimately the answer is a latter. It is so inherently intertwined with the story that we're telling that you can't tell this story that with, it, with the rawness and honesty you need to tell it with without, um, getting into these areas and making a more adult comic. And I always say it's a, it's an erotic uh, comic. It's a supernatural 
thriller. I think when people hear erotica, they have a different idea of how the comic's being positioned and maybe what the intent is. But this is, to me, a journey about self-discovery um, and, it's a, and it's a mystery story. And I think tomorrow in issue two, you'll see just uh, what direction this book is going in. But, um, you know, that's something we wanted to do because, and, and Sierra and, uh, wanted to do because it's a story Brian wanted to tell. But let me tell you, tomorrow, do not sleep on Maria Lovett's erotic second printing variant of Faithless Number One. Uh, it is when you see the cover, I have a feeling that is going to be um, one of the hottest second printings of the year because I think n we have not even teased out that cover. Re some retailers have seen re retailers have seen the redacted version of it, but it is a explicit cover. Um, and it is one that is tastefully done, but it's definitely adult. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, you know, we're really committed to um, exploring this journey, but also as you've noticed in the artist you mentioned, um, having female creators work only working on these erotic variants because we feel like that, you know, this is a place where it adds an extra layer of honesty and authenticity and a different perspective than you normally see on these covers. So having, a, having female voices leading this project is really important. We got a bolo right here live on the show, second printing, Faithless number one erotica cover. So if you weren't able to get that erotica cover in the first print, or you were able to get it and you just loved it and you want to continue to add to the collection, make sure you keep an eye out for that on shelves tomorrow. It's an entirely new piece of art. That's the big thing. Entirely new piece of art for that second printing erotic variant. So it yep. is... Uh, what I, what I will tell you is that roughly speaking, it will be, uh, it is gonna be significantly rarer, um, you know, uh, than the first printing erotic variant because second printings tend to have smaller print runs. See, I've learned from you guys. I read, the, I read, I read how it works. <laughs> and uh, so I'm being honest, like, uh, you know, it is going to be a significantly smaller print run. And so that cover is gonna be a lot harder to find um, but this, you know, uh, who knows what happens if we do a third printing, but, uh, definitely, um, the second printing cover as well for Faithless, the standard second printing cover for Faithless number one is just like this cover, but extended. So the way the art will work, you'll see more of these two main characters, Poppy and Faith. So like, it's going to be, um, I think if you like the first issue, uh, grab these covers cause they are going to fly off the shelves with, with Faithless two real quick tomorrow. I can't wait to, to get issue two. I guess that kind of, there, there's been a lot of love for the series. Um, how about how about the hate? Have you got any backlash from the series um, or from the erotic covers? No, not yet. Honestly, no. Uh, what we've mostly seen through social media, through emails to us has been people supportive. I think what helps is we were really upfront, I think from the beginning about what kind of book this is. And I think it helps, um, when you're that transparent, both with retailers and with fans, that this is, you know, mature content, and that I think people could tell by the way we were positioning the book. Maybe I'm patting myself and my team on the back, but um, we positioned the book in a very specific way that we didn't. This is not meant to be like this was not meant to be adult in like some titillating kind of way. We're like these are right. serious themes, and so I think because we treated it that way, the way Brian and Maria both talked about it on social media, it was really clear this of what kind of story you were getting into. And it's also why like we made sure the covers that you could see on the racks were um, obviously evocative enough of the spirit of the book without being, um, uh, without being, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We didn't want them to be like provocative in the sense that like we want them to be provocative and that you want to buy the book, but we didn't want, right. we weren't, they, they weren't there for shock value, right? Like they're pieces right. of art that represent the book. And then the erotic cover also represents the spirit of the book, but we also realized to do those covers the right way, you kind of had to shield the general public from that because you don't want some five-year-old kid coming in to get Adventure Time yeah. and then like yeah. noticing wow. something else. Yeah, I think y'all did a perfect job of that. I, uh, yeah, I, that, that's good to hear that there wasn't wasn't a whole lot of backlash from it. No, sure. no, I think the boom typical boom uh, boom studios reader uh, tends to have a. Uh, pretty broad view of things because I think remember we're the comic we're the com we, we do such a wide variety of comics featuring so many different types of people and characters from so many different creators different backgrounds that we're not just a we're not just one thing and I think everybody's used to the comic the the company being dynamic and a big thing we're doing this year is really 
if, if, you know, if what we do is a rubber band, we're stretching it to see how far we can take things. And can we do middle grade horror? Can we do different kinds of action adventure series? And we keep trying to do like new things that really diversify what we offer in the original series space. Talking about some of these uh, creator own properties, like I'll, I'll go through a couple and then I, I really mm -hmm. want to touch on one that you hit on earlier in Black Badge. But I mean, you, you've got titles like Bone Parish out there. You've got total titles like Ronan Island. Um, you, you, you've got a new one, even the one such as like Rocco's Modern Afterlife, which is playing off of a, 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 of a fan favorite in the past, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but the one that gets me is Black Badge. It, it gives you that yeah. Red Dawn type of feel. Um, yeah. Do, do, do y'all hear a lot of good things on that one? A lot of a lot of get a lot of good reviews. I, I know there's a there's a bunch of us in the community that, that dig that one and soak it up. Yeah, oh, that's the so great here. No, look, Matt Kent. I think uh, one if there's one thing for sure, Matt Kent is money. Like he delivers. It. Like when's the last time a Matt Kent comic didn't deliver for you? Um, and so. We found Black Badge is really, um, I love it. And I enjoyed Grass Kings a lot, but like Black Badge and the Canadian team in like issue two was totally my thing. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, Black Badge is, uh, I think is one of those kind of books that's so fascinating too, because even like the story structure, right? Like e the first few issues were like one and done, but they all kind of connected, was yeah. really, really cool. Um, so that's a book that's done really well for us. I think if you're a Matt Kent fan, you know that this was a, uh, you know, this was a uh, limited series, um, but do not worry. We have more Matt Kent coming your way in 2019. And uh, Matt is one of our favorite authors. Um, you know, Matt and Tyler are pretty, are golden together. They have been on Grass Kings and on Black Badge. Um, and, you know, the new Matt Kent project, I think if you like Black Badge, you're going to love what his next project is. But, you know, Matt's been... Um, Matt has been uh, absolutely a superstar for us uh, uh, from from the minute he came here and started working on Grass King. So uh, that is one of our hottest series. And I think, again, it's a kind of book. I'm not sure if you find anywhere else like these, uh, you know, Black Ops uh, Boy Scouts is not the kind of thing anybody else is really doing. No, no, no. it's uh, it, it's definitely it's out there and it's it's believable and it's it's great. I mean, it's uh, you've got the reader buzz on that one for sure. That's cool. And Bone Parish, you guys mentioned Bone Parish. How great is that book? Did you did you see the twist in the first issue coming, or did you not? I, I, no, of course not. I, I love it. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hooked. I know uh, Dan Pierce at the Reading Pile. I know he uh, from CBSI. He, yeah. he jumps on that one too, and 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 has nothing but good things to say about it. That's awesome. that's a great book, and and some of the, like some of the creative own properties that y'all got. I mean, it's like they're. I don't want to get into this realm, but I mean, it's like they were bred for the the big screen or the tv too i mean it's uh it, it, it it's there <laughs> is yeah, all i can say yeah. when, i think when, look, good 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 storytelling is good storytelling so i feel like when you tell it when you can tell a really good story in comics obviously some things are so comic book that it's hard to translate but i think a lot of what boom does is we focus on good storytelling and that is why um i think sony for properties you can see translating to like the tv and film side 100%. One of the things that I really like about Bone Parish is the environment itself is almost a main character. I mean, if you've ever been to New Orleans, it just, you get that, whenever you're down there, you get that dark magic or voodoo type yeah. feel. New Orleans plays a character just as much as, you know, the family does. But listen, like, I think that's another book too. That's an example of a project born out of passion. Like, New Orleans is a very special place to Colin and his wife. So that's why he wanted to set the story in New Orleans. And I think uh, if I can like call a bolo audible, is that a real thing? Uh, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, I, I think people who have their hands on a, a nine eight of Bone Parish number one uh, will be uh, will be very happy uh, down the road with that with that investment. So I would say uh, Bone wow. Parish is, I, I think uh, people who love that book are not just the people on this uh, interview right now or the consumers out there or the people in this office. There's a lot of people we're very passionate about bone pair. So I would, uh, I would definitely hold on to that one. If you got a good copy. There you yeah, go. You guys got it again. Another big bolo here. Live <laughs> tonight on the spotlight show. Arun is dropping gems. I hope you guys are listening. Yeah, no doubt. That's uh that's a big one right there. And, uh, I mean, 
it's one of those ones that it sets up to where it's like, how could it not to, you know, uh, it's, uh, you've got some great things going on on there on the creative own side. And I can't wait to see, uh, the more that's coming from Karen Gillen, like, uh, with the work he's done on die. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's unreal that, so that, yeah. that's definitely going to be a series that's primed up and ready for sure. Yep. There was uh, recently a secret project called Tooth Fairy uh, that saw surprise release of a new series. Tell us how that came about and uh, what are the plans for the series just moving forward there? Yeah, Tooth Fairy was the code name for Angels. So uh, Joss Whedon's iconic character. And uh, last year we uh, we were looking at it and saying we were looking at we knew we had the license for Buffy, for Angel, for Firefly. We knew what the Firefly launch plan was. We knew what the Buffy launch plan was. And we said, what can we do with Angel that's a surprise? Like, it's really hard in the era of the internet to surprise people, right? Like, I'm, yeah. I'm seeing the bolos every day from you guys about, hey, phase four Marvel rumors, invest in this book, whether it be like the first uh, brother voodoo appearance or it be like the first appearance of some other character. Like, it's really hard to keep secrets and it's really hard to surprise people. So we said, you know, what's the, what's, the, what's the iconic surprise in pop culture we all think of? Beyonce, right? Beyonce dropping those albums is a surprise. And it's really hard to do those big surprises unless you've got a big brand name behind it. And Angel's gigantic, celebrating his 20th anniversary in 20, 2019. Um, and we said, what if we just surprise release this book? You know, in, in Joss Whedon tradition, what if there's a twist? And so uh, last year, last summer, we started working on this plan working with our good friends at Diamond to keep this secret, a credit to Janine Schaefer, Gavin Gronenthal, Bryce Carlson, the editorial team here at Boom Studios, um, and the, our ops team here, our sales team, everybody who worked tirelessly to get this project together um, so that we could ship it out to retailers. So we let retailers know in January that when Buffy number four was gonna hit stores, there would be a surprise promotional item. You had to make sure you opted in for promotional items and the quantity you'd get would be tied to your orders for FOC of Buffy number three. That's a mouthful, but you know, for the retailers living this every day, we were like, please order up on Buffy three because this is how we're gonna dictate what you get for this promo item. And um, look, Angel is, uh, and so people, people knew there was a surprise character showing up in Buffy 4. And I think you could kind of guess it was Angel because we hadn't talked about him yet or shown him in the series yet. So Angel appeared at the end of Buffy number four. But the idea was now you could pick up Angel number zero and get an introduction to his world as written by Brian Hill and illustrated by Gleb Melenkov. And uh, honestly, like we couldn't be happier with how the book turned out. Um, you know, it was it was a huge launch for us. Plus, if you got if you were lucky enough to get the one per store, which I got behind me right here, if you got if you were lucky enough to get the one per store with Angelus, um, you know this cover is not being reprinted again. Uh, we're already on the second printing of this. You'll notice the second printing has the blue background, um, but this uh, the first this this Angelus variant we're not reprinting this again. This is the only time you on on Angel number zero you're going to see Angelus. So that one per store I saw shot up pretty quickly on the secondary market. Um, but, and, this th and this was a thank you variant. We wanted every retailer to get a nice little bonus because what we wanted to do with this is we wanted to put surprises back in comics and inject that energy directly into the direct market, into comic shops. So when Angel Zero hit, it wasn't on any of our digital partners' channels. We love our digital partners, but we wanted people going to comic shops to get this book and the response has been great. You know, uh, we announced this about a week before it was uh, going to hit store, so that people could go into comic shops, reserve their copies. Um, we had a ton of coverage. Uh, New York Times, Hollywood Reporter, you know, the comicbook.coms of the world, the IO9s of the world, everywhere, and we could not have been happier with the response. Um, and so, Angel is now a monthly comic. Issue number one is hitting next week, um, and then. Uh, issue number two in June has the first appearance, another Bolo Audible, the first appearance of Fred Burkle. If you remember Angel, uh, Winifred Burkle, she was, uh, she was uh, there's the scientist essentially on Team Angel, the smart one. And so Fred's first appearance is in issue number two of Angel in June. What's really important about all these, about Angel, much like Buffy, which I'm sure we'll talk about is, 
this has all been reimagined from the beginning. This is like the same way that Ultimate Spider-Man was re that Spider-Man was reimagined by Bendis and Bagley. Think of this as like your ultimate Buffy verse. And this, so if you loved Buffy and Angel before, like me, like I have two tattoos. I have, um, if y'all are Angel fans, I have the circle of the black thorn over here on my chest, and then Angel's Griffin tattoo from the Book of Kells that represents uh, one fourth the divinity of Christ. I have uh, on my shoulder here as well. So I love Angel. So I could not be more excited about this. And uh, you know we're uh, we're doing new stuff. But if you're an Angel fan like me, you're gonna love this book. If you've never read Angel, but you know Brian Hill from his work on the Titans TV show or Detective Comics, Batman and the Outsiders, or American Carnage, which is one of my favorite books. I should have mentioned that. Um, if you know him from that, he's bringing that same like hard hitting like raw writing style to Angel. So definitely check out this book. Sorry to say, uh, good luck finding the one per store, but you can definitely find the second printing of, of uh, Angel Number One. It has a blue background. You'll definitely find the second printing in stores right now. The uh, Angel Number One also features the first appearance of uh, Angelus's. Uh, we're going to show Angelus in the you know in the past. Angelus being the evil evil version of Angel. He's got his own evil crew that like. In the Angel TV show, like he had it, you know, he used to hang around with Spike and Drusilla and Darla, but he's got like Horsemen of the Apocalypse, like, and I mean, like, you know, like the Marvel style of that. He's got these crazy, like, servants in crazy medieval armor with crazy weapons who get introduced in Angel number one. And I promise you, they are a big deal late in 2019 and especially in 2020. They're a big deal. So, uh, I know I'm uh, unfortunately confirming some rumors you may have read online in places, but I want to make sure I do my service to the CBSI, the Simple Man Comics, all the Bolo bros and sisters yeah. and folks out there. We believe in non-gendered terms too. Whatever the term, the Bolo Nation, we want to make sure that you don't miss out on that too because what we're trying to do with each issue, if the first few issues of Angels, of Angels, of Angel, there's going to be like, major first appearances and we're going to advertise them. We're not going to be coy about them, but they're going to be, um, we want to make sure people jump on those because um, a few weeks from now uh, we are going to have a pretty major Buffy angel announcement um, that I think will make you want to make sure you have the first appearances of those characters. Awesome. That's some great info for sure. My friend. I, yeah, I uh, appreciate all that. I know everyone out there does. <laughs> We've talked creator owned books, and then now, obviously, the uh, Tooth Fairy secret announcement segued us beautifully into Buffy and the Angel and some of the licensed properties that Boom covers. Now, you mentioned yourself being a big uh, diehard Angel Buffy fan. Can you tell us a little bit about how Boom came to acquire the license that was, you know, long held from Dark Horse Comics? And how how big has that been for Boom to bring kind of the Buffy franchise into the fold? You know, um, I don't want to get too much into some of the business weeds because it's kind of boring and I'm not the one to speak about it. But I think, you know, um, I want to first say, I think, you know, to all the, for, to as on behalf of all the Buffy and Angel fans, like uh, thank you to Dark Horse for all the great work they did with Buffy over the years. We're collecting a lot of that in what we call our legacy edition format, uh, the big, thick, square bound, uh, soft covers that you know collect uh book issues chronologically so we have um the first one will be in uh from angel and buffy will actually be in uh in october for but for uh, angel's 20th anniversary you will see an angel legacy edition that collects in chronological order some of the earliest and most rare angel comics we already had a firefly legacy edition come out as well like that um, I think, you know, uh, and Christos Gage, a good friend of mine, he did, he's one of the many people who did amazing work on, on Buffy, uh, and Angel over the years. So thank you. Um, you know, what I can speak to is I think the business side is, you know, uh, licenses have terms, P uh, different companies have different ideas. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, happen to, I think, have a really good pitch for what we want to do with Buffy and Angel. And I'm sure other people came in with their great ideas and pitches and, that's all the contract stuff. But what I can tell you is the appeal creatively for us is um, we have a lot of people in this company who are giant Buffy and Angel fans who, who can all remember where they were when Buffy ran the sword through Angel, even though he had stopped being Angelus, but had to like, you know, save the world who all can remember the first time we saw 
oh, I got him right here. First time we all saw the puppet angel, right? Like we all remember this. Um, you know, like we all, uh, we have a lot of fans here. And I think what we all saw the opportunity was that Dark Horse had done a really good job continuing the television series, plural, um, as comics. And they had done a great job of it. And I think they ended season 12 in a really cool place. But what we looked at and said is, you know, how do we help a whole new generation come into comics and discover this? And I really would point to Ultimate Spider-Man, the Benison Bagley book, and the whole Ultimate line is a real example of how that works well. That line, um, it, you didn't, it, getting into Ultimate Spider-Man didn't mean you didn't enjoy JMS's and JRJR's Amazing Spider-Man. It just meant you had a different version of Spider-Man, and if you'd never been into him, you could you could get into that world without the um, all the continuity, right? And so it allowed us to tell story, new stories, not just including cell phones, but we got it allowed, um, I think Janine uh, Schaefer, uh, Gavin Gronenthal, the editors on the book, and then Jordi Belair, the writer um, on Buffy and Dan Moore, the artist, to really reimagine the characters and say, what new stories are there to tell and how can you find new takes on the characters? So for example, you know, um, the thing that they always say about the book is that, you know, one of the big differences had to be, Willow would have a very different arc being a teenager in California, um, uh, you know, a queer teenager in California, she would have a different arc uh, because she wouldn't have to have this giant coming out story. It's LA, it's 2019. I think we look at identity in such a different way. Um, and uh, so it allowed us to launch a series with her being already in a relationship with Rose, um, who's going to have a pretty major role in the book as well. Um, and you know, it allowed us to position Xander differently. It allowed Buffy to have a different relationship with Giles in that like her attitude towards um, slaying and Giles' attitude of responsibility towards her uh, could be modernized a bit. And it's probably the weakest example that I think about it, but it allowed us like Drusilla, we don't have a ma we don't have the master, right? The master is not in this comic. We have the mistress and that is Drusilla. And it allowed us to have a, this cool female villain to face off against Buffy. It allowed Spike and Cordelia to have like a different dynamic because you can see why those two might have got along. And it allowed Cordelia to even be reimagined, not as like a, um, with all respect to Charisma Carpenter's great work, it, sometimes she was more like the typical that big girl and she wasn't shown to be smart. Whereas she gets to be this beautiful, confident woman who also happens to be smart and athletically inclined, but isn't like, that stereotypical female character who, if she's beautiful, has to be shallow or cruel. And so I think what you have, again, having a book um, led by a writer as, as uh, talented as Jordi Belair, you have this um, diversity of uh, character appearances, uh, of character uh, reinventions and nuances that's really made the book, I think, such a critical darling too. And like, I'm telling you guys, that book, the attrition month over month is so minimal because readers are staying with it. And it's, um, that's really been cool to see. And I think uh, that was, we saw potential there. We saw potential to reintroduce Angel. And I think, I think vampirism itself and the questions of agency and, and uh, redemptive justice are more important than ever in this era of, uh, of Me Too discussion and more questions about, um, about redemption and when, we're, when we can be redeemed. And so all those themes felt universal and we wanted to approach them again. Oh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think you mentioned, you know, you mentioned the diversity of characters. Also, you guys have brought in a diversity of cover artists. Um, issue one saw a one in 25 variant from heavyweight Jen Bartel, who's as hot as they come right now in the variant cover art game. Issue number four, which had the big angel reveal, saw Jenny Friesen doing the uh, one in 50 variant that yeah. we covered on the bowl list amazing and i was just looking at solicitations for issue five and you've got yasmine putri doing um the uh one in 25 and one in 50 and another major up-and-coming artist that we talk about is kind of poised to hit that next level um what are is that something that you guys are consciously out there trying to do is is get some of these big up-and-coming uh cover artists is it just people's love for buffy or um you know is it just kind of been a happy circumstance that it's worked out that way because you guys are putting quite a roster together look i'd be lying if i didn't say that we weren't aware of who's hot obviously uh, you know i mentioned ross i mentioned bryce carlson who's our vp of editorial we are all collectors we have and so like um you know those are the uh those are the ways like we're always thinking about that so we, we'd be lying if we we said that wasn't on our mind but like you were talking about jenny frizen and like 
these covers didn't come about because we were chasing speculators or collectors. You know, I don't know if uh, speculator is a dirty word or not, but uh, I don't think it is. Um, and it's, uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we, all, we love having speculators check out our books, but first and foremost, we always want our books to be made for the fans, for the readers and uh, credit to Janine Schaefer. So if you don't know who she is, she was, uh, she, I've known her for 10 years. She's a really great friend of mine, 11 years. She was an editor at Marvel. Um, she oversaw projects from girl comics to the, uh, to astonishing X-Men, like when, when North Star got married, um, she spearheaded the Brian Wood, uh, Olivia Coppell, uh, relaunch of X-Men. She oversaw a whole bunch of big X-Men books. She worked on a bunch of Avengers books under Tom Brevoort. Um, she was an editor at DC who worked on, uh, on, uh, count, not countdown. Uh, what was the first, uh, weekly book? 52, of course, 52, 52 weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 52. Uh, she worked on the Legion, which of course makes me think she's the best. She edited books like uh, Motor Crush. Um, so like she is, she has a bit of a Midas touch when it comes to this and like a sixth sense for, for, um, for finding talent. You want to know who gave Scott Snyder his first big two gig? Janine Schaefer on Iron Man Noir. That is when I wow. met Scott Snyder. So like she wow. like, yeah, she, she, she has this incredible eye for it and she'll be so embarrassed. I'm just raving about her here. But she picks the artists. She just like, she wants, look, she wants female artists bringing the Buffy world to life. She also wants the best artists. It happens just that we're at the point in the industry where some of the top hottest artists, like you guys mentioned, are female artists. So it's right. a nice convergence of it. But like, we're always looking for cool voices. Like Kevin Watt is doing all those beautiful variants. They're almost like, uh, what's the term? for like They almost look like shoujo variants if they were like manga, right? Like everybody is so pretty and beautiful. And that's not because anyone said make pretty beautiful covers. Janine's like, I want beautiful covers of the Buffy cast. I'm going to hire someone to make them for this book and people are going to love them. And, you know, that's why so many of her covers are open to order. We just want people, retailers, we want retailers to be able to order what their customers want. We want customers to get them. And yeah, we'll do some of the, you know, like uh, unlockable or ratioed, whatever you call them, variants. But really, we always want to make sure that we pick the best cover artists and that we're never just going back to the same people. So if you like Jenny Frizen in the Whedonverse, uh, stay tuned for some really, really big stuff. I got to tell you guys, though, these Slayer variants to each issue of Buffy, these have been our C cover. They've been open to order. So you should be able to find some out in the wild. We announced our Chosen Ones one shot hitting in August. So these covers, I mean, you, y'all are the experts. So you can debate what if a cover is the first appearance or not. The old Spider Gwen debate, y'all figure that out. But they're <laughs> the first time you ever saw these characters is on these variant covers. And you're going to see some of these slayers who've been on variant covers make their first full appearances in all new stories in August in Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, colon, the Chosen Ones, a one-shot special that explores these slayers. And it actually will impact the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series too. So, you know, we don't have we weren't just doing these variants for fun. Janine knew from the minute they created these variants that each of these characters had a backstory that we were going to tell. Slayers of times past, and it's what I call them because I'm stuck in my Starman times past uh, naming conventions. But like these are Slayer variants, and like these ones, honestly, keep an eye for these because you're going to see a lot more of these Slayers making their first appearances in full length stories. But the first time you got to look at them is on these covers. So I defer to Bolo Nation on what a real first appearance is, but I'm just giving you my two cents. There you go. I like it. We're, we're, we're stacking up the Bolos today for you guys for the <laughs> buying options. But yeah, I think that brings me to like my, my last kind of Buffy question. It's more kind of a kind of your fantasy matchup, dream matchup. You mentioned uh, one of your close personal friends being Donnie Cates. He used the first uh, video interview I ever did for YouTube. And when I did that interview, he was wearing a Buffy shirt. And I asked him what uh, what characters he would love to write in the future. At the time, he was only uh, he was with Image. He was doing creator own stuff, uh, so it was pre Marvel. But he said the two that he would love to do were Spider Man and Buffy. So what would it take in the future to get Donny Cates to do a Buffy book for Boom? So like like I said, I, I love Donny Cates like a brother. Um, I moderated his panel at WonderCon, and we legit got into a fight about this on stage. It was not like if, – and for anybody who was there at the panel, we didn't orchestrate any of it. Like he revealed to me 
Oh, I'm going to tell you Donny Cates' story. I'm going to tell you Donny Cates' story. And it's all part of this. We were so when he was an intern at Marvel. That's when I knew him, right? That's when I first met him. And he told me he was from Texas, right? And so he's like, I was like, Oh, you a Cowboys fan? And he told me, Yeah. And so every Monday I would talk to him about the Dallas Cowboys, and he would tell me something like, Oh yeah, yeah, man, the defense they just they got penalized, or man, the O line was just falling over all the time, because like Tony Romo was my QB. Um, and uh, I'll go all Trell Owens on you and start crying through my shades right now because that's my QB, man. But, uh, you know, uh, he every Monday would come tell me stuff. And I'm not kidding you. I did not know this. Apparently every intern at Marvel knew this. 11 years later, we're on stage at WonderCon. And he's like, hey, you know, I got to tell you something I hadn't told you before. And I'm like, oh, man, is he going to tell me how much he thinks I'm a good friend? We like literally say I love you to each other. So like. I'm pretty sure I know we love each other and we're family. And like, uh, like I'm very, mixed, I'm very much Dominic Toretto. I don't, I, I, I don't have friends. I got family. And I'm like, cool. Like, that's good. He's a good time. And he's like, I've been lying to you for 11 years. And Michelle's sitting in the audience and I just look at him and I'm like, what? And he told me that apparently he used to call his dad every Sunday and be like, hey, can you just tell me a few things about the Dallas Cowboys to say to this guy? He's being real nice to me. I can't bear to tell him I don't give a crap about football. <laughs> so this is my boy, Donnie Cates. We got into an argument because I correctly know that Wesley is the best watcher in the Buffyverse. Because unlike Giles, he doesn't let his slayers get killed. And so and he doesn't let Buffy get killed multiple times. Uh, sure, faith goes evil, but come on. So we got into this whole argument about it, and he, I know he is, his love for Buffy goes deep. His love for Giles in particular runs deep. Um, when he was uh, living here in L.A., he went and uh, visited the high school where they filmed Buffy, the exterior of Buffy. And, like, uh, he had took photos there because he loves it so much. Um, look, man, uh, I talk to the guy all the time. Uh, I, I would personally love for him to do it. But if I'm being honest with you, like uh, there's such a there's such a crazy well mapped out plan for the Buffy verse right now. Um, there are no Donny Cates plans at the moment for Buffy. Never say never. He loves Buffy. Uh, you know we love Donny. Um, and like I would personally, as his friend, I would love to uh, I would love to have an excuse to work with him um, all the time. But uh, he's, uh, he, I think he's got his hands full with uh, Absolute Carnage right now. I think he's, him and Ryan are planning to sell over 8.1 million copies of that. So I think let's do, let Donnie get through selling that and breaking a Guinness record. And then we can talk to him about how much time he's got for, uh, for other stuff. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers has seen a major resurgence in the comic scene for those who aren't. Familiar, um, if you follow me on Instagram at AKA Mr. Bolo or the com at Comic Book Invest CBSI account, you know that a regular book that we have boloed is that Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number nine, the first appearance of Lord Draken. Um, we have also talked about Go Go Power Rangers number eight, the first appearance of the Ranger Slayer, two of the newest characters in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers universe. We've really kind of taken collectors by storm. I would love, I would love to know. Kind of dating back to the first time we saw anything on Lord Draken, we saw that YouTube um, kind of vignette or video that uh, Jason David Frank was involved in, um, which kind of was the hype for the Lord Draken uh, appearance. I would love to know how did all of this come to be? How was how was this character kind of conceived, and what has it meant for the Boom franchise having or the Battle of Power Ranger franchise on Boom? having Lord Draken become such a hit with collectors and readers and especially old school Mighty Morphin Power Rangers fans. Yeah, uh, so I joined Boom just as Draken was being introduced. So one of the first things I was involved with was trying to drive up sales for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number nine. So uh, I am going to, uh, man, I, I'm, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're, you're like Chris Jericho, you are gonna put me on the list right now. I can see you getting the pen ready to click it. Um, but, uh, I'm going to do another, uh, Bolo audible, which is, uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number nine, that first appearance of Lord Draken, uh, seriously, get your copies graded. Trust me, get your copies graded. Make sure I know everybody chases that second printing, the, uh, Goni Montez cover. I get why it's beautiful, 
but make sure you get like even that regular cover. I think people are sleeping on that one. Yeah, that one is that one is hot. And I've seen some people talking about it lately, including yourself. So thank you for that. You're the ones who've been tagging me. I know you're paying attention to it. You also tagged the first appearance of the Ranger Slayer and Go Go Power Rangers. Um, number eight, yeah. Make sure you have those because uh, those characters, uh, we're really proud of the characters. And what I can tell you is that, you know, um, Daphna Plebin, who's uh, the editor on Power Rangers book here, Kyle Higgins, who was writing the Power Rangers book and had an incredible, iconic run on it. Um, and along with the team at uh, Saban, now with Hasbro, um, really we're trying to create something special and cool. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we all know Tommy's like the, the goat of the Power Rangers franchise. And uh, they found a way to, I think, to take the best of, um, of, uh, of the Power Rangers and do something cool with it, which is like, what if there was an actual evil version of that guy? And so uh, that was a lot. Of, that was a really cool thing to walk into because fans lost their minds. I lost my mind as a fan. And then Shattered Grid, you're talking about the trailer for that. Um, you know, I when I was at Marvel, I mentioned Tim Dillon over there, him, uh, myself, and then James Viscardi, who actually runs ComicBook.com now, but used to be uh, used to work for me at Marvel. We're all connected. Um, uh, he, uh, we, we, we used to work on a lot of trailers at Marvel for, uh, you can go and search on YouTube and find trailers for Uncanny X-Force, uh, Amazing Spider-Man big time, uh, for Siege, for some other ones. But when I came here, I'm like, you know what? I don't see a lot of comics trailers anymore. And thanks to our friends at, uh, Saban, Melissa Flores, uh, Jason Bischoff, um, a lot of good folks there. We were able to, uh, we were able to work with Jason David Frank, who we work with a bunch, and get him on to do the audio. His first time ever doing audio as as Lord Draken, and narrate this really cool trailer. Um, and that thing did over a million unique views for us in less than 24 hours, which for a comics trailer is gigantic. And um, I think two million view over two million views in, in less than 48 hours. So that was big for us. And Draken, I think, has been a as uh, the torchbearer and the signal bearer for like. Um, what we're doing with Power Rangers, we're telling stories in Power Rangers canon. This is not a, a this is not a reboot. Some some aspects may be remixed because the clothes are a bit different or the references are newer, but this is in canon, and um, we're ba we're telling these stories and finding new areas of the world because the, the Power Rangers mythos is so rich. And we're finding new ways to uh, tell stories in that world, and like, look. I don't know how many of you uh, have your graded um, Goni Montez Power Rangers uh, zeros, um, but uh, you know, since the beginning, we've been trying to tell really cool stories with this series. We went from Shattered Grid to Beyond the Grid, where we created a whole new team of, uh, of characters. Uh, or we brought together a new team of characters who you just learned in Power Rangers 38, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. You saw the first appearance of the Solar Rangers in their new costumes. Now, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 39 is their first appearance on a cover, but Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 38 is the first appearance of the Solar Rangers in their all new costumes, their Solar Ranger costumes. And the Solar Rangers, while Marguerite's uh, uh, amazing work writing uh, um, Power Ranger, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers will wrap up soon, the Solar Rangers are important. And remember, Ranger Slayer is on that team. And so uh, that was a real big one for us. And um, I think with the spirit of Lord Drac and an introduction, it's really a big part of what has inspired Necessary Evil. So Necessary Evil is a new Power Rangers story uh, event beginning in pa Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 40 in June. Uh, Ryan Parrott, who's been writing amazing stuff on Go-Go Power Rangers, is coming over. He's going to be writing both books. He's going to be co-writing Go-Go Power Rangers with Cena Grace. But Mighty Morphin, a necessary evil, it brings us back to Angel Grove with the Power Rangers and the White Ranger. And if you're reading this book, uh, you got a whole bunch of questions because the last time we saw the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, they disappeared in the white light at the end of Shattered Grid. And of course, you knew they'd be back. We're in continuity. But you're like, how did we come back? Who is the White Ranger? How do we have a White Ranger here? Where have the Power Rangers been? what happened after Shattered Grid, and why does no one remember what, ha what happened in Shattered Grid? So those are all the mysteries we're gonna be exploring with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and Go-Go Power Rangers. So Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 40 is the first uh, 
first necessary evil uh, chapter tie in. And then that's in June. And in July, uh, Go Go Power Rangers 21 is, uh, which brings Tommy to that cast. Um, it, it's set in their high school days there. That explores also what um, uh, happened after Shattered Grid. And they're, and like always, Go Go Power Rangers and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers take place in two different times within the same continuity. But like Shattered Grid, you will see important details in both books. So you could have read just in, in, in Shattered Grid, you could have just read Go Go Power Rangers and you would have got a complete story and met uh, Ranger Slayer. But if you just read Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, you would have been good too, but you never would have met the Ranger Slayer till the end. It, it looks like the next big thing for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers is coming in issue 40. Um, and and lots of buzz around the issue. Um, it, basically, what can you tell us about the issue uh, and any other ones that we may need to look out for um, in that run? My personal big bolo for everybody is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 40 has the first appearance of a team of Power Rangers. So the characters are characters you know, but new a new team of Power Rangers with new costumes and a new name. Their first appearance is in Power Rangers 40. And let me tell you, for me as a fan, it is the biggest thing we've done in Power Rangers comics. That's me being honest with you. I'm not trying to hype you up. It is the, it is, it is like there's a big piece of Power Rangers canon that fans like myself have always wanted to see explained um, or explained more. I don't want to tip my hand completely. And I think when you see who these uh, three new Power Rangers are who are a bit obscured on the cover to Power Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 41, when you see who they are, you're going to be shocked that that is the thing we are tackling and that that is the actual answer. And when you realize what the answer is, and it'll take you a couple of issues to explain it all, um, you're gonna be like, holy crap, I knew what was coming and I just read a PDF of Power Rangers 40 today. And I was like, oh, when you get to that last page, you're like, no way, that's like, it's so perfect. And it's, oh, it's so perfect. Um, also on those issues, we're bringing these Goni Montez covers back on Power Rangers 40 to 49, but we're doing foil versions of them. So the White Ranger covers on Power Rangers 40. So those foil versions, um, you know, uh, you're de they're, they are, if, if you guys know anything about the Goni Montez covers, they're hot. They're always hot. Um, but uh, these are open to order for retailers. So hopefully your local retailer stocked up really well on these. But I have a feeling that these are going to be pretty popular as well. So that's, again, that's another major bolo there, guys, if you've heard us talk about Shattered Grid. Shattered Grid kicked off with issue number 25. We it, it, Already we've talked about the first appearances of the Ranger Slayer and Go-Go Power Rangers number 8, Lord Draken in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 9, but also when that Shattered Grid storyline kicked off with issue number 25. Issue number 25 still sells $15 to $20 in various printings as well as those variants where you see the Rangers – those are hitting several of those into the 20s. So keep an eye out. Be on the lookout for issue number 40. Hasn't come out yet. Again, hit your LC up for pre-order. Take a look at those incentives. Check out the Boom Web Store, which also does pre-orders. Um, and be sure to be looking out for that, as well as issue 41, which I think has an interesting, um, uh, interesting solicitation as well. And there could be some value going in there. So I can't believe that I've gone this long with the rune here from Boom Studios without bringing up pro wrestling and more specifically WWE. Yes. Jack and I, one of our side bars that we always talk about that's not on the YouTube channel as we always talk WWE and wrestling in general. We're both huge fans and recently I've picked up a bunch of 9-8 copies of Boom's WWE comics and the 1-100 in uh, Randy Savage variant, the... Uh, one in 50 Fraser Irving Undertaker variant. I got the New Day variant. So I'm gradually picking up nine eights and all those great WWE titles. There's some I'm still missing, but love, love, booms, WWE, WWE books, especially the Raza covers. But yeah. the covers in general are great. So can you kind of tell us a little bit how the partnership came about and how it's worked for you guys with WWE? I am a diehard, lifelong WWE fan, as you can tell, because I'm seeing her like a doofus with this belt. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I, again, the WWE deal predated me joining the company, but honestly it was, there are folks at, at boom who love wrestling who said, Hey, I think we can do a really awesome wrestling comic. And you know, Eric Harbour and editor Jasmine Amiri, who then has since gone to Lion Forge, editor Chris Rosa, um, all wrestling fans and felt like there could be some really cool stories to tell in kayfabe, you know, within the world of wrestling that took it a bit uh, more seriously. Like I enjoyed the paper cuts um, crime series they did. You know, I enjoy that stuff, but I think what we've looked and said is uh, we looked at this and Ross said, hey, I may not be the biggest wrestling fan, but I got people at this company who are passionate about wrestling. They believe they can tell a good story. And like I said before, the best stories come from genuine passion. So um, Boom and WWE struck a deal and we've been so pleased with what we've been able to do with them, telling a lot of really awesome stories. Um, one of the big joys has been uh, for me personally has been uh, being able to write promos that uh, the talent then record. So I've written, uh, we've done some promo videos with um, Becky Lynch, with the Undisputed Era, with uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, with uh, Andrade and Zelina Vega. And I got to tell you guys, it is such a thrill to hear these wrestlers say the words you wrote for them. Um, and yeah, they may be contractually obligated to do it, but it doesn't take away from the coolness. Um, if you have a chance and you search the, uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn video, we did, they did to promote their arc, the Sammy and Kevin show or Kevin and Sammy show that's now available in collection, a soft cover collection. Um, it's, it's a hilarious promo of those two. And then, you know, uh, I threw up the undisputed era sign at the beginning, beginning of this video and uh, this interview. And like, I'm a giant undisputed era fan. So having uh, Adam Cole say words I wrote for him uh, is just super cool to me. And so, um, you know, that's been, uh, it's been really fun to work with everybody there. Uh, the wrestlers all love the comics. Um, uh, Seth Rollins and Joshi G, who's his, uh, CrossFit trainer, um, who I know from an event I went down to here in Venice, uh, we supplied them with some comics for a recent CrossFit event. They had WrestleMania weekend. And like, it's really cool to see the wrestlers like really, um, all buying into the like all buying into these comics and being excited and promoting them naturally. So it's been a really cool partnership. You know, there are monthly series recently ended, but we do have more WWE projects to come. Uh, we are excited to continue our work with WWE. And I think right around uh, San Diego Comic Con, expect some really fun announcements about new projects between Boom Studios and WWE. So that's that's big news. That's another again another bolo here talking about be on the lookout for those uh, WWE Boom Studios announcements around San Diego Comic Con time because I know myself I, I'm definitely disappointed to see the ongoing series and looking forward to some more WWE content from Boom. But uh, one of the questions I had for you was um, talking about kind of like the women's evolution storyline. Obviously, yeah. we at CBSI we're a secondary market kind of based organization and um we, i was kind of wondering we talked about this actually a little bit before we went on the air the sales of like the alexa bliss variant the women's evolution storyline was a big hit the variant covers uh took off and did really well in the secondary market um i was really wondering was does boom track those type of things do you guys pay attention to what those things are selling does it factor into your creative decisions and uh when can we get the man becky lynch and the champ champ on a variant cover well, uh, actually, it's funny you say that. I, I know we've done uh, some Becky Lynch covers, but I know you want we want the new version of Becky Lynch with some variants. Uh, look, again, I'd be lying if I told you guys we didn't pay attention to this. When I'm telling you that Ross, Bryce, and I are data scraping all the time and looking for good deals, like, of course we know what's hot. But I think the challenge is we have to make good comics with the best covers and the best cover variant cover program that makes sense for fans and retailers. And what we try to do is find the intersection of serving that group best and also making covers that speculators and collectors want because like we're all collectors here on some level of something. Like I look, I have like, I have hockey cards at my desk. Like I collect hockey cards too. I'm a big Montreal Canadiens fan. Like we're all collectors. I'll show you what I just bought off eBay. I just bought the reign of Superman pogs off eBay because I wanted an unpopped sheet. Like this is, this is how much we all collect things here. So um, Bryce and I have been both on a trading card collection kicks. He's been collecting all the old Marvel series from Intel. Um, so like, but when we look at these covers, we're always saying, what's a cool thing we could put on cover that people want to buy? Like, I think that's a very basic thing we have to do, which is um, we got to make covers that people want, but we also want to make sure that our editorial team has the freedom 
to create the covers they think are viable with the artists they think are cool. Like no one tells them you need to use Raza. You know, Chris Rosa, who edits those books right now, he loves Raza's art style. He knows Raza is uh, popular. He puts them on covers. You know, like there is that separation of church and state, we, which I think is really healthy. But yeah, we um, like, I think another one that was a sneaky hot book was the Ronda Rousey variant cover to WWE uh, number 25. Uh, that cover, um, I saw get a bit of heat uh, right after it released because it was the first uh, solo uh, Ronda Rousey cover we had done. Uh, she also appears um, on some other variant covers, notably one of the variant, the Kendall Good variant cover to WWE Forever number one. You'll see her as one of the many characters on that cover too. Um, but you know, the women's evolution, look, we, we know that uh, there are certain wrestlers, a certain talent who have great appeal. Alexa Bliss, definitely one of them. Um, she's very talented. And so we're always working to, um, to make sure that we have a variety of cover spotlighting the hottest um, talents. And I would not be shocked to see a Becky two belts champ champ variant um, in the future on an, on an upcoming issue where it makes sense. Uh, certainly we all know how popular Becky is. We know how popular the new day is, um, yes. you know, and you can see part of how the, the, the structure of the WWE ongoing series changed, right? We had that first year about the shield, but then we did these smaller arcs so we could highlight those other hot characters. We did the NXT limited series so you could highlight those characters. So that was actually um, my favorite part. Yeah, that's really it's really cool. And you know, Chris Rosa is a dyed in the wool wrestling. He's a dyed in the wool combat sports fan. So like you couldn't ask for a better editor on these books. And Chris is always trying to find the cool new stories to tell. Um, and you know, so that whether it be like uh, these specials like WWE Forever number one. Oh wait, whose name is on that book? Oh, that's me. <laughs> Um, but you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, wh whatever the stories are, he's always trying to spotlight the big t old talent, the talents of yesterday with the talents of today and the talents of the future. So while we don't have a monthly WWE series, trust me, we are focusing on get delivering really awesome projects like the undertaker, uh, original graphic novel next year. We we've been, you know, we've experimented with different formats. We've experimented with different story lengths. So expect some new cool stuff in the future. But if look, Last year, if you were at San Diego, uh, you got to meet uh, you got to meet WWE talent at our booth. The year before, every year you've got to meet the New Day or Becky Lynch or Charlotte Flair or Ric Flair at our booth. So if you're a WWE fan, it's pretty safe to say you want to come by our booth, at San Diego, because you're probably going to meet one of the top talents in WWE. That's uh, that, that's awesome. And all right, I got to go back. You uh, you, you flash the uh, the WWE forever here. And it, it, it's not just a great cover. I mean, this one's special to you for another reason. Uh, your, your name is on it. Like you said, you, you have a story in this book. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, internal audit is, is the, the, the sub story in that book. And tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I am a man of many interests and, uh, one of the things I, I have passion for is writing and I've, uh, always wanted to write comics. And one of the great things work about boom is they really nurture that creativity and give you opportunities. So, um, the, uh, the advantage I have being in the office here is that I know some folks here and they know my interest in WWE. And so, um, you know, in pitching boom on a few different things, uh, they, they, uh, connected me with Chris obviously who I know, but, uh, you know, we keep, again, church and state separate. I don't talk about my writing ambitions in the office and uh, cause it's not fair to anybody else because I'm the head of marketing. You got to talk to the head of marketing here. And I pitched to Chris the way that any writer would pitch to Chris. I said, here are my story concepts. Um, hope you want to, you know, buy one of them, uh, or someone approves them for, uh, for a WWE comic. And, uh, to my surprise, it was the IRS story that he, um, that he was really into, uh, I'll tell you, to be honest with you, the IRS story, it's a story about how IRS and uh, Ted DiBiase form Money Incorporated. It's their secret origin. Um, it actually all was inspired by an episode of Justice League Action with it written by Paul Dini, um, where Mongol kidnaps the Joker, thinking he's an actual like Joker to make his troops laugh. And I also thought it was just a really funny play. And so like the origin of the story was, what if someone kidnapped IRS thinking he was an actual accountant? or an actual tax guy. And like, you know, he always seemed like that in the, uh, on, on television, but you never, um, you know, they never ever fully explained it. So uh, I wanted to tell a story about like how 
in kayfabe about like IRS and what motivates him. And I wanted to tell a story where IRS was a hero of the story because going back and watching those promos, all he was asking anyone to do was pay their fair share of taxes. That's not a bad guy. Like, I mean, he was evil for all the cheating he did, but like, otherwise, like that's a pretty fair position to take. So uh, I was trying to find a way in eight pages to tell that story. Um, what I can tell you is that the story was really well received and it opened up uh, some other opportunities. So um, I can tell you this is not the last time you will see my name on the cover for WWE comic. Uh, more details to come. But uh, that was a great experience. I'm so thankful to Chris Rosa and to Editor-in-Chief Matt Gagnon for giving me the opportunity. Really thankful to everybody who covered the book. I'm honestly, it means the world to me. Like I feel like a dork talking about this to you guys. But it really means a lot that you brought it up and that like, you flashed a comic before we even did this interview. And like the fact that you all took the time to do that means a lot to me because um, I, you know, I love comics. I love pro wrestling. And this is uh, it. This means the world to me. The belt I actually have over my shoulder was um, a wedding gift from some friends at WWE for me. And I wore it at my wedding. So uh, this is like, re yeah, wrestling is a big part of it. And uh um, you know, this is, uh, it's something I'm really glad to contribute to. So, you know, we love being able to tell, um, do these specials and tell stories about wrestlers you might not otherwise tell stories about my, uh, two characters, the two, uh, Vin, like old school wrestlers. I really would love to write about one day. Uh, the first is the Mountie because I love the idea that he can't come to America and arrest people, but he has to make sure he fights them up in Canada to prosecute them. I think it's just funny. <laughs> Um, like, I don't know if you remember the show Do South from the 90s, but it makes me oh, think. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then uh, The Goon, because I like the idea that The Goon is like a hockey player, but also a wrestler, uh, which is like, and I want to know, like, when he get like, I have a very specific story in mind for that, but I really, um, I would love to see, what, like, how do you make The Goon seem cool? Um, and how do you make The Goon work in kayfabe? Uh, I love those characters. Like what the old school wrestlers could do is they had these really fun characters and there's so much room to like do different things. So I always appreciated, uh, I always appreciated them. For sure. Oh yeah. There's so much from, uh, the Brooklyn brawler to Waylon Mercy to, uh, the red rooster. There's so much you can do. Yeah. And do a, a ride along with big boss man and Hexel Jim Duggan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that, that's the fun stuff. But I mean, like, there's a lot, there's so many cool modern wrestlers too with fun characters like Bray Wyatt. Like, I know, like, I think I love the way the Firefly Funhouse thing they have right now. It's so wacky. And there's a lot of cool stuff like that that I'm really glad uh, that we have. Um, that wrestling has a diversity of characters. Like, you can have someone serious like the Man or Champ Champ, and you can also have like someone ridiculous and fun like uh the or the original the original bro uh matt riddle like i love that um nxt is like my thing so like velveteen dream that's like the perfect character for me i love the dream he's so good um undisputed era is so much fun like that's the stuff that i uh you know that i love about wrestling you can do anything in it. if we if we can get a velveteen dream purple rain homage i promise you that's a sellout I promise you, Chris Rose is exactly the editor who would love to do because he, him, and I both love the dream. He came in when I missed NXT. He's like, "Did you see the dream couch segment?" And I'm like, "I'm sure it's fine." And I watched it. I'm like, "Oh my god, you were right. This is amazing." <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, that is um, no, it's amazing. It's uh, rest pro wrestling is uh, the best, uh, warts and all. So, Arun, we've talked about a lot of things so far. We've talked about Power Rangers. We've talked about Buffy. We've talked about wrestling. We've talked about creator-owned. I think we've covered a lot of material. We want to take this time. Is there anything from Boom that you would like to promote or just talk about in general? The floor is yours. I want to say, like, I guess the main thing I'd say is, you know, everybody watching, uh, thank you for all the support of Boom Studios. We've kind of seen it this year and, like, you know, Faithless sold over 35,000 copies. It was gigantic for us. Um, you know, Buffy, Angel, Firefly have been huge sellers. So thank you to everybody who buys our comics. I obviously, I hope you open the cover, you read them, you enjoy them. But you know, uh, thank you to all the all the all the collectors too who are coming in buying those covers, who are giving us the feedback. Like you three, like y'all are great about sharing with us which covers you love. And like, I think sometimes in this industry we look at um, we think of speculation and collecting like it's a bad thing. And, I don't, and I'll be honest, I personally do not believe any of that's bad for the industry. Like, 
If you're going into your local comic shop, you are paying for your comics, you're picking up your pull list, you're pre-ordering, and you're like, and you're doing, and you're like, uh, you're being just a, a good a good person about it all. Like that's awesome. Like I I think I I go to I when I go to comic cons now, the way Michelle and I think about buying back issues is like it's no different than going to Vegas and gambling, right? I can go put forty bucks down and play blackjack, or I take a certain amount of money with me to every show, and I'm like, this is the money I'm going to use. And either I'm going to buy that first appearance, uh, either I'm buying the first appearance of Carnage, which keeps going up every show, um, yeah, or I'm going to buy uh, a bunch of like '90s X-Men and like other stuff. Like uh, I was joking with Ross that I really want to buy the first um, appearance of Forceworks, which I guess probably is Forceworks number one, but I want it nine eight because that's my super long-term play is Force Wars. Eventually, Kevin Feige has to make a Force Wars movie. Um, I want the all the first John, like I want the first appearance of John Walker. I want the first appearance of John Walker as US agent. I want like, I want to complete my John Walker collection. And honestly, I don't want, I don't like when people say that that's somehow not as valid as me like buying all the new comics off the stand and reading them a million times. Like, I love comics. I love comics enough that I just love owning the comics. And like, there ain't nothing wrong to me with like, having this comic slab, if that's my enjoyment out of the comic, great. Like, I think as long as you're buying comics and you're happy with your purchase and you're not stepping on anybody else's happiness, I think, you know, um, you sh we want you in comics. And at Boom, like, we want to make comics you want to read and that you love, like Bone Parish and Faithless and uh, Once in Future, when that comes out from Kieran Gillen. But we also love that, like, you know, part of the reason we're all talking today is uh, I, I dropped you, you all a line and said how much you've helped me with tracking down some books. Like, you're going to hate me when I say this. I had in a long box the Siege number three Deadpool bling variant just sitting there. I didn't wow. worth anything still. And, <laughs> and then I looked and I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's getting graded now. <laughs> um, and yeah. Like, yeah. I think it'll come back in nine six, probably not a nine eight, but maybe nine six, and um, which is still pretty good. <laughs> and uh, but you know, like that's fun. I love discovering that like some random comic I have is worth something. Like what you what you do, what CBSI does, what Simple Man Comics does, what Indie Spotlight does, what all the bolos do, what all the sites, apps, everybody who covers this stuff does is. I really believe you give us another way to find joy from our comics. So I just want to say thank you to all of you, the three of you, everyone who does this work for doing what you do, because I actually enjoy and love comics more ever since I got into like this side of it. And so thank you guys for giving me another way that I can love comics. And honestly, it's a really fun hunt that my wife and I go on now trying to find like great deals on back issues and find good condition ones. And that's something you guys gave us. So thank you for that. Arun, one of the things we like to do on this show, it's a little lightning round, five questions or so. Um, some are comic related, some aren't comic related. Just uh, lightning round, just fire off the answer that comes to your mind quickest. So you ready for this? Yep. All right. Becky Lynch or Charlotte Flair? Becky Lynch. Because I, I was at a CrossFit event where she was there as well. So technically, we could technically have worked out together because she, she had just got her black eye. And she was uh, on a bike, and that defeats a point of a lightning round if I'm answering the question. No, you're good. You're good. As long as you answer, as long as you answer, next question: favorite Boom comic series. Favorite Boom comic series. Uh, right now, the one that is totally my jam is Bone Parish. Coming up, Once in Future is my favorite Kieran Gillen script I've ever read. All right, so this isn't comic related, but what's your favorite guilty pleasure food? My favorite guilty pleasure food. Oh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Yeah, for sure. Not even a question. Part B to, to that is, do you like the regular chocolate or do you like the white chocolate better? Uh, I tend to generally be a white chocolate fan more, but I actually think the regular chocolate tastes better in this. And I'll just follow that up with, because I'm a big guy and I like Reese's stuff, but I like the, the season things, like the trees and the eggs, because they have more peanut butter than the regular chocolate cups. It's really good <laughs> Easter actual Reese's Easter eggs that are like actual eggs you bite into, not the ones that are flat and shaped like eggs, but the actual eggs. I honestly put them like five pounds in one eat week because I kept eating three packs of those a day. I would eat twelve eggs a day. <laughs> <laughs> Last one, lightning round. What's your dream job? Honestly, man, it's it's what I do. Comics, comics, 
in any form. Obviously, I love writing comics. I'd love to do that more. Um, and, and that is uh, all in my hands to be uh, to give the right pitches. Um, but working in comics, man, uh, this is Boom is a special place, and I love being here. That's going to conclude the lightning round for this episode. Andy, you got it from here. Oh, man, I just uh, I, I can't thank you enough, Arun, for coming on here and, and sharing all this information with, with not only us, but everybody, CBSI Nation. Uh, it it was just unbelievable the amount of stuff you, you gave us. And uh, like I say, I can't thank you enough for coming on. If uh, Make sure and check out at Indie Spotlight Series on the Instagram uh, for, for constant updates on, on all of Boom stuff uh, and uh, all of anything uh, coming up in the future. Um, so, like I say, I'll, I'll throw it to Jack here. I want to thank Andy, of course, uh, you know, the writer of the Indie Spotlight series for the inspiration behind this show. I want to thank Brian uh, for having us here on Simpleman's Comics. Um, I want to make sure everybody knows to check out comicbookinvest.com. The Indie Spotlight series article, which comes out every Tuesday on comicbookinvest.com. Um, be sure, like Andy said, to be following him on Instagram. He drops a lot of Instagram exclusive content, a lot of Indie Spotlight series bolos. And uh, speaking of bolos, be sure to check us out right here on Simpleman's Comics every Thursday night, 9 p.m. for the live CBSI bolo show here on Simpleman's Comics. And of course, most importantly, I want to thank Arun for being our guest here today. Uh, we got a lot of great information. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as we did to be here and discussing everything with him. Um, and there's a lot of great nuggets and more bolos packed into this show than you could imagine. So make sure you guys are out there pen and pad ready, taking these notes for when you hit that LCS, because there's a lot of boom stuff with meat on the bone out there. So uh, make sure you guys are on the lookout. I want to take the time also. I definitely appreciate you coming on, Rune. Uh, this has been a really great conversation. There's a lot of hidden information in there I think you put out tonight, too, that if, if people are reading between the lines, which they should be, there's a lot of good bolo information. Andy always does a great job of writing the Andy Spotlight, as as we said before. Uh, big, We're all big fans of Boom. So one, one series we didn't talk about a lot that I really liked back was uh, the really enjoyed the Sons of Anarchy series. Um, Lumberjanes is another good series. But definitely a lot of good information tonight, and we could probably sit here and talk for hours and hours and hours longer, but I think we got a good wealth of information. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight, Arun. And with that being said, before we go, hey, you get, you get the last word. Uh, I was going to say thank you all for having me here. Uh, remember, undisputed. Right. So, yeah. Well, hey, and I'll put it out there anytime. You're welcome on Simple Men's Comics. <laughs> Be sure you guys are tuning in with us, Simple Men's Comics. Like you said, YouTube channel, lots of great content coming. We're debuting the hot cold list this week. We've got the Indie Spotlight series show, CBSI Bowl o list, the Simple Men's Comics weekly picks, and tons of new small micro content, uh, a lot of fun things. Thank you again for Arun for being here, and absolutely you are welcome. At any time, we'd love to do a part two to this, um, specifically after maybe the, the Power Ranger story comes out and we, we see what the market unfolds. We'd love to bring you back and talk about that. So you're definitely welcome anytime, anytime you want to talk about anything Boom Studios or Indie Comics. We are happy to have you here. Thank you so much.